Thank you, Scott. And thank you for being here. You look good today, despite what some people were trying to tell me earlier. You, you, you look like you have your mind and your spirit all in the same place, and you're all here in a happy group. And even Bill looks better than you did on Thursday night, Bill. Uh, but thank you. Thank you to all that crew that put on a great uh, meal here on Thursday evening. How many of you were here? All right. Do you attest that it was good? All right. It was. Much, much, much appreciated. On your bulletin, you'll see the little tear-off sheet if you have a message that you'd like to share, a question. Just uh, they tear off very easily. Um, uh, fill it out. If you're a visitor here today, we encourage you to fill this out. Put it on the offering plate, and we'll be able to see that uh, uh, and uh, try to help you in any way we can or answer questions, whatever it might be. Notice the announcements in the bulletin. This big thank you to Bill and his helpers, uh, a bunch of them listed there, thinking about the whole year. And somebody said, what are you going to do next month? Absolutely nothing. Nothing July, right? Nothing. Oh, am I being corrected? No. Uh, I just want to let everybody know downstairs after church, about 35 to 40 folks walk up. So anybody's welcome to them if you want, go for them. Uh, yep. Come first service. Yeah. Okay? And those were. Again, thank you to everybody that did help. Like, the people that set up and servers, cleaners. It was very, very good. Now, pulled pork. Down where I was raised, we just call that barbecue. barbecue. That we, if, we, if we want a barbecue sandwich, that's what we... Whatever you want to call it. There, there are about 40 of them downstairs. All right. So if you want to be real happy after church, you just stop downstairs. Now, something else after church today. Carolyn tells me that there are going to be some pictures on the screen of the supper on on Thursday night. So if you want to see those on the screen, just stay after church and, and watch. And uh, by the way, after church on Sunday morning, you know what's a really good thing to do? Just sit back down. After we have the benediction, before you leave here, just sit back down and listen. Because this guy does some stuff over there that's really worth hearing. And I don't know what it is, what's it say he's going to do today? A Takata. Oh, you're going to be on the organ this morning. Once in a while. A Takata. You know what a Takata is? It's fun to listen to. That's what it is. So you, you'll be aware of that after church today. So you'll get a double treat. You'll hear Scott at the organ, and you'll see pictures on the screen. Why would anybody ever want to go home? And then before you leave this place, go down through the kitchen and get a barbecue sandwich. Now, Aren't you glad you came to church today? <laughs> that doesn't often happen, but today is that special day. Notice the other announcements in the bulletin. Call your attention especially to next Saturday, a memorial service for uh, and remembrance of Jan Nickerson at 1 o'clock here with a reception following uh, downstairs. Uh, notice the other announcements there. And if you would, please look on the back before you leave here today. Thank you for your generous support to the one great hour of sharing so far. And then a couple of announcements about future dates. Should I join this church? This may be a very perfect time to become a member of First Baptist Church because we're in the process of calling a new pastor. We don't know when, we don't know who, but it's in process. And Joan will keep us updated on the uh, process as soon as she gathers herself from her trip and all that stuff. Uh, so thank you. Notice those announcements. And if you'd like to host one of those Sunday, Sunday evening conversations that is listed there over the summer, let me know. 12 to 15 people maybe on your front porch, in your yard, or in your living room, whatever, as we uh, talk a little bit together about what is happening and what might be happening as we move toward the future. God's future and First Baptist Church. Come thou fount of 
every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Beautiful words, hymn number two. Let's stand and sing it together, please. Let's pray together. Our Lord, we come to you today in the name of Jesus. We come to worship, to offer ourselves in praise and adoration, to bring our petitions to you, and just to be in your presence. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your precious promise that wherever we are, you are there in the midst. When we gather in your name, you are here. You have preceded us. You are welcoming us into your presence. Thank you, Lord, for this place. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for this privilege that is ours through Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Thank you. And be seated, please. We have our mission moment. Oh, you're going to tell us the truth, aren't you, Bonnie? I'm not sure. You're not sure. I think there's a light up there. Yes. So besides being lame, I'm blind. Right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Let's get this thing turned on here. All right. There. All there, right. Thank you so much. I want you to notice I scribbled on this because Mike told me that intelligent people doodle. All right. <laughs> Okay, now I'll behave. He doesn't always tell the truth. Oh, dear. Oh dear. What about Don? Don told me I yeah, look like I he's just all got right. out of bed. Yeah, he's all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we're starting the one great hour of sharing. And 
before I say anything about that, I want to tell you the blessing I had this past Sunday. My son-in-law's mother has been very sick. Thank you, Jean, for praying. She came home Wednesday. We thought she was going to die. They purchased her casket and everything. And I said to my son-in-law, do you want me to come when you have the funeral? And he said, I'd rather you came while she's living. Well, I haven't seen her once besides 43 years ago when we shared a grandson. And so we went to the hospital to see her. And she saw me coming by the door and she goes, <gasps> she hit me right off quickly, tickled to death to see me. I had written letters to her when her husband died, probably 10 years ago. And she's, she's moved since then into senior housing from St. John to um, Fredericton. And I thought that her apartment, we saw her apartment, I thought it was very sparse, but she said, I still have those letters you wrote me. So we don't know when we touch a life and what it does, but that's what we do with this one great hour of sharing. We share our lives with other people. Good. We think of Africa. <laughs> when I came from Sherman, we used to sing that little song, please don't send me to Africa. <laughs> I don't know if you sang that here or not, but we sang that. And uh, so anyway, this, for me, this week has been Nebraska. They've had twin tornadoes, and we will help with that, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And we think of being one as we will be one with Africa, we will be one with uh, Nebraska. But you know, we're one with each other. We sing that, uh, bind us together. We're one in the bond of love. But do we think of it? Do we really think I'm one with you and you're one with me? And that's really, this has been good that I had to do this because it really spoke to me. And here is the letter that the um, coordinator of the offering wrote. And it's really nice and I liked it. It says, the glory that we have, that you have given me, I have given them so that we may be one. As we are one, I am, I in them and you in me. That, I can't read very well, you can see that. That they may be complete, that we may be completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved me, loved them, even as you have loved me. With his beloved disciples that Jesus prayed for connection and unity, perhaps we know the understanding of others would be one with the great challenges of the human beings and that they, they may, I can't read this because I don't see very well, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I, I underlined some things. This is what I was coloring, is uh, the denominations. It was seven decades now, nine denominations in the U.S. united to have to, to that's the word right there, to have together been conquering, connecting people together through one great hour of sharing. And sometimes we just throw the money in the basket and say, oh yeah, there you go. But do we remember that these are people, they have needs and we need to help them as they need to help us. My friend that I saw Canada, in Canada Sunday, her son said to her, do you remember Janet's mother? And she said, oh yes, I pray for her every day. That's very touching from a woman I only met 43 years ago. So let's remember to 
that we're one. We're one with the person sitting beside of us, the one up back that we hardly ever speak to, the one in Nebraska that's lost their home and all of that. And let's give to this cause that these people might have a quality of life like perhaps they had or maybe like they've never had. We don't know. We don't know a lot about them. But let's, let's work to contribute to this one great hour of sharing that they might have a quality of life. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bonnie. You want to help me down? <laughs> And today, Carrie, oh, there she is. Okay. Is this good, Carolyn? Okay. I'm going to actually have you guys stand right up on the top row here. There's just a few of us this morning, but I like to use this Sunday school, um, well, the children's story as an opportunity to recognize our students in the Sunday School program. And a lot of times when we start this part of our service, we ask each of the students, what is their rainbow? And this is the day where we share with you what our rainbow is, and it's each one of you. You've been a blessing to this church, and I, I was really touched by Bonnie's presentation about missions, and I want to let you know that you, each one of you, have touched our lives and having you as a member of our church. And I know that sometimes we can't be here every Sunday because we have a lot of things that are going on with our families and sometimes it's illness, but every time that you are here, you are a blessing to each one of us. You bring energy, enthusiasm, and the love for the Lord, and we see it through your works um, every time that you sit here and every time that you come downstairs with us. So we want to say this time, thank you very much. I'm going to give you a token of appreciation, but before I do that, I'd like for each one of you to say your name, and we remember you, but what grade that you are going into next year, because these children are growing with us every year. And some of you might remember that most of these students started as toddlers right on the same stage, and they continue to grow with us, and it's been such a blessing. We have a visitor, and we're going to appreciate you. Thank you for coming and getting up and coming with your friends this morning. What's your name, sweetie? Annabella. And what grade are you going to? I'm going into first grade. Going into the first grade. Jonathan, and I'm going into second grade. John's going into second grade. Ella, and I'm going into third grade. Benjamin, and I'm going into seventh grade. Mackenzie, and I'm going into seventh grade. So we've got all the gr almost all the grades represented here, and um, this year. Our senior, our high schoolers didn't have a Sunday school program, but what they did is they used their work through missions and helped with all of us downstairs. And it's been a blessing that they've been able to continue their work through Sunday school as a teacher's aide. Say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They're getting an, a treat for after church, a token to Houghton Farms Dairy, and I've given them a ruler to show their growth in, in Christ and with us as members of First Baptist Church, and then just a pin um, to, to demonstrate to the world that their love for the Lord. All right, um, let's give them a round of hand. Thank you, Carrie. And thanks to Carrie and others for uh, being arms of ministry and service as they work in all of your behalf with uh, young people. And by the way, there's room for more, right? Always room for more. So keep that in mind. Blessings. We've had one already shared. Wasn't that a good sermon she presented? It was. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, My grandson also flew in to surprise his grandparents from Ontario. And we went up to surprise him. So we had a wonderful time. Now let's see. He came here to surprise you. You went up there to surprise him. <laughs> he flew into Fredericton to see his grandma. Okay. And we went up to Fredericton to surprise him. 
All right, good. So a meeting in Fredericton, a family. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Family gatherings. Blessing. Another blessing. Somebody else. Yes. All right. Safe traveling and safely at home. Something nice about home. Yeah. Yes, they, blessings for, I, we had a great trip down to see my sister and a great time visiting with her. So. All right. Nothing like family. We're glad to see you back. <laughs> Another blessing, anybody? Yeah. You know, Wayne and I had a great time at Gardner Nursing Home. Oh, good. That sounds good. Thank, thank you. And thank you for doing that, Bob. Thank you. Uh, concerns. Prayer concerns. Anybody like to lift some today? Hal. Hal, yeah. At home with bronchitis. Okay. It's a hard time. Prayers for them. Yeah. Very difficult time when you lose close family. Other prayer concerns? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege of praying for each other. Sometimes we don't even know when somebody sitting right beside us is in real need of our prayer, of our prayerful intervention, the warm embrace of a loving arm, just the what seems to us to be so simple, the simple concern for someone so, Lord, we know that in this room today, we are a people in need of prayer. So we lift each other to you, the one on our left, the one on our right. Some of us living with each other and forget to pray for that loved one. So Lord, hear us take this opportunity to pray for each other. Those in our homes, those in our neighborhood, those with whom we just share a pew on Sunday morning. We are and we want to be a people of prayer, a people of compassion, a people of faith, believing, Lord, that you are real and that you are really here, that you hear us when we pray for others and ourselves, and you not only hear our voices of gratitude and great joy, but you hear our deepest need. So, Lord, we pray today, because you are here, because we believe that you hear and you do respond, you do answer according to our need and your provision. And as we pray for ourselves here in this room we do remember that we join with a people all over the world, a world caught in evil, while at the same time being a world filled with beauty. And sometimes, O oh Lord, they come into such contrast for us. We don't understand how it can be so beautiful and yet 
such evil exist in the world. We don't understand. But Lord, we pray to you that you will, through our Lord and your plan, bring redemption, bring reconciliation, bring hope, bring peace and beauty in this world where sometimes we see more of the darkness than of the beauty. We know, O oh Lord, that even without understanding, we are caught in this world. And so we pray to you, because we are a people who are not only seeking you, but in finding you, know that ultimate peace that comes from knowing you. So give us that peace, the peace that passes understanding as we yield ourselves to you and your purposes for our individual lives and our corporate life here as a church. So today we would remember also to pray for this church. Pray for its leadership, the search committee, the calling of a new pastor, all of these things. We yield to your will, to your purposes, to your provision. So we pray today, each of us in our own way, but each of us always in the name of Jesus Christ, who is today and forever our Lord. In his name then, amen. The ushers are prepared to lead you in worship as you present your tithes and our offerings, your offerings today to the Lord.
God, how we want to praise you, how we do praise you, how we say to you, thank you, Lord. And in that spirit, Lord, we have presented our gifts, our tithes, our offerings. And now we ask, Lord, that you would bless them. Bless these gifts. Bless them to their intended purpose that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ would be honored and glorified through his church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before you're seated, greet one or two or three or four people. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 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 Blessed be the name of the
Thank you. Be seated. Now, before the sermon of the morning, the third sermon of the morning, or the fourth, or whatever it's going to be, take a hymn book and look at hymn number 256. You notice up at the top, it says, the theme is the Holy Spirit. And we're going to pick up this morning on the sermon of two weeks ago, where we uh, looked at what the Bible says about who is the Holy Spirit, and we discovered, maybe didn't discover, but we affirmed that the Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is not a part of God. The Holy Spirit is God. And we're going to look this morning at when you're in the presence of the Holy Spirit, what does that Holy Spirit do? Hymn number 256. Uh, Scott and I both like this song. It's in a minor key, which we don't usually sing in church. And we don't know this song. Well, a few of us do, because we sang it in prayer meeting a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago. He is here. He is moving among us. He is here as we gather in his name. So I'm going to sing it. Believe that. All right, and then we're going to take another offering. <laughs> That'll be a thank offering. Thankful he doesn't do that very often. So I'm going to sing it, and then we're all going to sing it. He is here. Just listen to it, and then we'll do it together. Mm, he is here. He is here. He is moving among us. He is here. As we gather in His name, He is here, He is here, and He wants to work a wonder. He is here as we gather in His name. Now you're going to sing verses 1 and 2. He is here, He is here, He is moving. He is here, He is here, as we gather in His name. He is here, He is here, and He wants to work a wonder. He is here, as we gather in His name. He is here, Lord, He is Lord. Let us worship before Him. He is Lord, He is Lord, as we gather in His name. He is Lord, He is Lord, <clears throat> praise and adore Him yesterday and today and forevermore the same. So whether we're talking about God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, we're talking about the same person. He is here. Now, if you can understand that, then you're probably the greatest theologian who's ever lived because a lot of people have tried to explain it. Nobody's ever succeeded to explain the triune God successfully. But we recognize the Bible teaches God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Bible also teaches through the words, the mouth of Jesus, He is here. He is present. Where two or three are gathered together in His name, there He is in the midst. I have promised, Jesus said, never to leave you or forsake you. And we looked at some scriptures last, a couple of weeks ago about Jesus promising that the Holy Spirit would come. He would be comforter. He would be counselor. Wonderful. But the Holy Spirit is God. Well, let's listen to what the Scripture says He does. John chapter 16. I'm going to begin reading at verse 5, and I'll read down for a while. Have your Bibles open. And uh, 
take a pew Bible, turn to this scripture. The sermon will hopefully make more sense if you do. John chapter 16, verse 5. Now I am going to him, Jesus is speaking. Now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you ask, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Counselor will not come to you. The Counselor, the Paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, some of the translations say, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. I, Jesus, will send him to you. Now, verse 8. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment in regard to sin, because men do not believe in me, in regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no more, <clears throat> and in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. <coughs> I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. In a little while, <clears throat> you will see me no more. And then after a little while... You will see me. Now, take a moment, turn over to Galatians. If you have a pew Bible, it's got the page number in there for you. <clears throat> Chapter 5. And in Galatians, Paul is speaking now. And he's speaking to that church, down in verse 16. So, I say to you, live by the Spirit. Capital S, Holy Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of sinful nature. Now that's the important. Live by the Spirit. And so then down to about verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I'll stop right there. We're going to be talking about what the Holy Spirit does. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would capture our minds and our very beings, our whole body, soul, and spirit to yourself, and that you would speak to us, speak to us in our inner being, that we hear from you, and understand something of what you are doing in our lives right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Normally when we think about the Holy Spirit and what he does, we think about nice things. The comforter, the counselor, the one who stands alongside. And it, it really is very important for us to kind of get hold of that idea that he stands with us. The Holy Spirit is not apart from us. The Holy Spirit is available to every person in this room. The Holy Spirit is available to every person who breathes. As a matter of fact, we discovered, or we, we were reminded a couple of weeks ago, that when God breathed into Adam, God put his spirit into Adam. The word breath in the, in the Old Testament is the same word as spirit. When you see the word breath, it's God breathed. And as a matter of fact, in the New Testament, the, uh, Paul uses a phrase about uh, the scriptures. All scripture is inspired, is God breathed, inspirited. All Scripture inspirited by God to breathe into that Scripture and is profitable to us for reproof, for correction, in order that the person of God, the man of God, may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works, whatever that means. We understand this business about God breathing into us. So it's not as if God is hiding somewhere behind a pulpit God is not hiding somewhere away from us. God is present by his, in His Spirit. God is here among us. We discovered that. And then this scripture reminds us 
that Jesus would send that spirit which would testify of him and lead us into all truth, helping us to teach us, but also, he uses that word, to convict, to convince the world. Actually, when the, when the Bible uses the word to reprove, it's the same word. But he will convict the world. Wow, what good news. You mean that's not my job? Exactly. Exactly. It is not your job to convince or to convict or to reprove the world of its sin. Guess what? They know it already. Because God did not hide it from them. God sends spirit into the world to convince, to convict, to reprove the world of its sin. You remember Eve? What was her husband's name? It was, oh, Adam. Yeah, that was it. That was it. Eve and Adam back there in the beginning had this idea that eating that fruit would be a good thing to do. Remember that story? But somebody had already told her that's wrong. Already told Adam, too. He knew. In fact, somehow they got the idea. How does this say it? God told them, don't eat of the tree, that tree in the middle of the garden, for the day in which you eat of it, you're going to find bad things happen. To convict the world of sin. To convict the world of sin. Don't you love that word sin? Every time I gets bigger than the S and the N, it's sinful. Every time the big I approaches, I know better. You see, if we were in charge of the world, it would be an autocratic world. It would serve me. It would do what I wanted to do, like the automobile that moves us when we want to move sometimes. The automatic transmission. You put it in gear and it does its own thing. It's auto. It just happens. That's self. And we live in that kind of automated world. Eve did too. Whatever is good for me is good for everybody else. Adam, taste this, it's good. And she kind of winked, if you will, at this conversation that already existed when God said don't and the old devil said do and she yielded to the do part. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? The Holy Spirit is the one who convinces, who convicts the world of sin. But Jesus makes an interesting point, or the Bible makes an interesting point of this, and if you notice it in the scripture that I read to you, convicts the world of sin because they fail to believe in... It's simple language, isn't it? The world, Jesus said, failed to believe in him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, what, believes in him should not perish, hmm, should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And John begins his book by talking about those who believe in me, though Jesus would say, those who believe in Christ, who received him. If you notice in John chapter 1, verse 12, he puts those two together. To believe in Jesus means to receive him, to receive Jesus Christ as God's gift to us for sin. That gets so simple, it's complicated. And so complicated, it's simple. That we, 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 repeat, we, we preach this gospel that if I receive Jesus Christ into my life to be the Lord of my life, 
then I'll be saved. If I believe in him, if I honestly believe in him, that Jesus was who he said he was, and that what he said is true, and what he did is real, then his death on the cross as an atonement for my, what? Sin is a real thing. This gospel thing. And God's Spirit comes to convict the world of sin, but also to convict the world that Jesus was who he said he was, and what he did was really what he was supposed to do, and it brings atonement. It brings at one meant between all of us who are sinners and the God who created us. He will send his spirit, he will send the spirit into the world to convict the world of sin because they didn't believe on me and to convict the world of righteousness or lack thereof. Sounds kind of repetitious, doesn't it? to convict the world of righteousness. And you notice why it said that? Because Jesus is no longer in the world. The very portrait of what righteousness is, the only perfect person who ever lived is no longer in the world. He's gone back to be with the Father, Jesus, resurrected from among the dead, sitting now at the right hand of the Father, all beautiful, picturesque world, hard, words, hard to understand, but the reality is that's what it says. To convict the world of righteousness because righteousness has gone to the Father. So we can be righteous not by our own deeds, but we become righteous by what God does through His Spirit. God does through His Son. God imputes to us the right, the right to be righteous, the right to become children of God. That verse, John chapter 1, verse 12, to those who believe in his name, who received him, to them he gave the right, he gave the right to be called, you remember what it says? Children of God to convict the world, to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, and of judgment. Because the prince of this world is what? It's gone, gone. Greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. The one who would seek to control you is destroyed, is beaten. See, the war is over. The war is over for those who place their faith in Jesus Christ. And God's Spirit does not speak on His own God's Spirit speaks what He is told to speak, and He glorifies Jesus Christ. That's in that text. So the Holy Spirit is not a spirit that operates outside of God's authority and power. It is God in spirit. As Jesus is God in flesh, Spirit is God in spirit. And in that text I read to you, it says, and he will guide you into all truth. So the Holy Spirit has his job to do. And we partner with the Holy Spirit in receiving God's Spirit and receiving that instruction. To receive God's Spirit in the same way we receive Jesus Christ to open the door of our heart and to receive God's Spirit inside. Now, there are a couple other things that need to be said because usually when we think about God's Holy Spirit, we think about what Paul said about gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, 14, and 15. 
Now, I didn't say chapter 12. I said chapters 12, 13, 14, 15. Let me explain what I mean. Because I did, a long time ago, I was kind of taken with this. In the Bible I had, chapter 12, Paul writing, begins this way. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, okay, but the word gifts was in italics. And you know what that normally means in a Bible, don't you? It's an implied word. It's not there. And Paul begins a great treatise here on now concerning spirituality. It's participial in form. Not that that matters to you, but I like the idea of it. It means being spiritual. Now concerning this whole concept of being spiritual, being filled with the Spirit, being baptized in the Spirit, having God's Spirit living in you, concerning all of this, do you want it? Do you want to experience this? That would be his question. Then let's talk about it because God's Spirit does not divide, it unites. God gives all kinds of gifts, all kinds of, the word is charismatic, charisma, all kinds of gifts to the church. Some for service, some for expression, some for working, all kinds of gifts to the church that they all may be one, not divided, all together. And Paul makes his case, and he puts in there the second commandment, which I will preach on someday soon here. The second commandment that Jesus said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Because chapter 12 enters into chapter 13. And Paul kind of transitions there, that there are three things that remain with us forever. Love, uh, faith hope and love, these three. But the greatest of these is, you got that one, you remember that one. And so Paul makes his case all around this, that God's Spirit has all of, we are different, you and I. We have different gifts, all kinds of gifts. But because I have the best one, because I'm the smartest, and I've got the degrees to prove it, because I'm the best one here, I'm the one that stands up here, and I get all the attention, right? Wrong. See, the person who opened the door this morning has the same level, the same standing with the Lord. We are all one. Nobody is better. So you speak in 47 languages. You're no better than somebody can only speak West Virginian. <laughs> I understand that. I understand it very well. You don't. And that, I've, I've had this argument already. That's not pulled pork, that's barbecue. That's West Virginia. We understand that. But Paul goes from all of this talking about gifting the church that we can all be edified, be built up. He moves from that to the great love chapter, chapter 13 and 14. He gives a lot of instruction. And then in 15, chapter 15, good old Paul, he comes back and said, look, I gave you something at the very beginning, and I want you to zero in on it. It was the gospel. For I delivered to you that, first of all, uh, as of first importance, that which I delivered to you already, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Born of a virgin Mary, died that horrible life, death, resurrected, and we've seen him alive. The power of the gospel. The Holy Spirit is interested in the power of the gospel. That's why he began this. He would convict the world and of, of, of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. It's been done in the power of the gospel. And the Holy Spirit unites us all together. And then one final word. It's that passage in Galatians. I love the way Paul writes this because sometimes Paul writes to a people who have asked some questions and he answers those questions. And he talks about worldliness, living in the flesh. And then he talks about spiritual life, living in the spirit, living for oneself. You want to do it? You're going to get a lot of bad stuff. And he lists them all, Galatians chapter 6. Living by the spirit, you're going to get a lot of good stuff. And I don't know why television and radio and popular songs aren't filled with this good stuff. I don't know why it becomes so obvious in the Bible, and it makes sense to me. Maybe I'm the one that's stupid. I don't know. But love, joy, peace, long-suffering, 
goodness, gentleness, meekness. Against such there is no law. God's Spirit is interested in producing fruit. And if you notice in the Scripture, the fruit, singular, the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits of the Spirit as if they're all separate, the fruit, one Spirit producing in us this magnificent, can you imagine a tree that would have oranges and apples and all this stuff on it? No, you can't, and I can't either. But this tree of life, this tree of God's Spirit is full of the kind of fruit that would make such a difference in the church and in the world and in our lives if we allowed God's Spirit the freedom to move and to produce for us, to allow the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to be in us, to fill us with Himself, if we could just begin to put down deep roots in what the Bible calls the Christian life, and begin to live that way, all of us together, then our lives would show more of this love, joy, peace. We aren't there yet, are we? Love, joy, I'll just stop at those three. Love, joy, and peace. Loving each other. In peace, among peace, expressing peace. Love, joy, peace. Long-suffering, endurance, suffering long when necessary, having patience to see the end rather than the present circumstances, having the presence of mind to know that we aren't created really for this world, we're created for heaven, to be able to understand that somehow God in His mercy sent Jesus Christ to give us a bigger message than we could possibly understand, and that God in His Spirit is leading us into all truth. The truth that we do need the gospel. The truth that we do need Jesus Christ, His teaching, His suffering, and His experience of success, of, of, of glorification, of sitting at the right hand of the Father, that end results. We need the experience, the prayer of Jesus who said, to this end was I born. For this cause come I to, the, to this hour, as he faced his own Calvary. To make sins out of present circumstances, present limitations, to make sins out of that as a part of the path that leads us into the presence of God to know eternal life, eternal life, where there is no suffering, where there is no pain, where there is heaven. God's Spirit is all about that. God's Spirit is not meant to divide us to say who is deserving and who is not. God's Spirit is not to divide us to say who is good and who isn't quite there yet. God's Spirit unites us, unites this body to say you are the ones that God has placed here for this hour on, in this moment to be His people in this world in 2014, in this moment. It is God's Spirit that is moving among us right now. He's promised never to leave us nor forsake us, promised to be with us. That is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, at work among us and within us to unite us to become a body with God's body throughout the world, the body of Christ, to do His work, His will, by His authority, in His power. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who is comforter, who is counselor, paraclete, the one who stands alongside, comes within us. The one who convicts, the one who redeems, and the one who leads us into the very presence of God as we grow, as we groan in our growing, and as we come, become more and more and more the mature body of Christ, this Holy Spirit, who does not work on His own, but glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. He is God in spirit moving among us. Let's pray. Father, way down deep somewhere inside of us, we want to be spiritual. 
not to be better than somebody else, but to become more than we limit ourselves to being, to become more of what you want us to be. We want to be fruit trees. We want to produce that fruit. We want to be people who love, be people who experience joy, to be people who are peacemakers, who endure in difficult times and rejoice in your presence in the times when our heart just soars. So, Lord, we sing our praise songs. We sing our laments. We bring to you everything that we are and have because we can entrust that to you. And Lord, we know that you are redeeming us. You have showed us the way to salvation. And you are at work in each of our lives, cleansing, reproving, helping us to become more than we think we are, that we can be thoroughly furnished, completely equipped, men and women of God. Holy Spirit, have your way in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be. I love the way somebody talked about that at one time. Take my life and let it be. Sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Let's stand and sing together. No, I don't. <laughs> What's that number again? I'll find it. See, it's not just the computers that give us trouble. 379 stands as one, five, and six, please. we ask that you would not only take our lives, but you would really make our lives count. Count for you. Count for your purposes in the world. Count for what it is you're trying to do in our world. Lord, work through us your miracle of life and living. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>